So that is important, I think, the comorbidities in choosing some of these agents. And that, you know, there's study out there that looks at the potential for cardioprotective uh, role of biologics. And, and I think that's important. You know, there's a study where they looked at patients with um, severe psoriasis who were placed on a biologic and um, the burden of coronary plaques was decreased. The patients who were not on a biologic um, increased. So I think the comorbidities have a key role in this. And I think um, just to kind of circle back around because I always, I always want to keep in mind that we have a lot of colleagues who do not use biologic therapies and they go back to the cyclosporin and the methotrexate and we are other agents like you know acetretin um, and I think targeted therapies is really the road that ties into the pathogenesis we learn more about the pathogenesis we can target these therapies so I right. think that's key and, and the only point I want to make with that when you say biologics and cardiovascular protective we really only have data that shows that that's the case with TNFs you know, it's, right. uh, and I'm not saying right. it's not going to come for the right. other classes. Right. But as of right now, you know, Joel, uh, Joel uh, Gelfand put out a nice study on looking at MI and psoriasis risk. Right. And we know that if you're 30 years old with severe psoriasis, you have a threefold increased risk of having an MI over someone who doesn't. So and that's linked to severity more than it is overall. Right. But we also know that with TNFs, that there may be a re reduction as much as 50% in your instance of MI. Now, I think we're going to see cardioprotective effects and other effects with metabolic syndromes with some of the other classes, too. But we can only say that with confidence with data in the TNF class. I, I think so. so. When you're looking at controlling the inflammatory burden of the disease, as opposed to just thinking about controlling the signs and symptoms, doing things that reduce the flake, reduce the itch, Instead, you have to think of it as how can I help control the inflammatory burden? And as Margaret said, specifically to the, uh, if affecting the cytokines that we know are most specific in psoriatic diseases. And as Douglas mentioned, the earlier therapies that came to psoriasis and came into dermatology after they had been used in a lot of other diseases, severe diseases, like severe rheumatoid arthritis, now we are fortunate that we had access to those, but now a lot of these therapies, if you look at the 23s particularly, those are only being used in psoriatic disease and in skin psoriasis and plaque psoriasis. So they're very, very specific. Mm -hmm. And as we look at the uh, sort of baggage that may have been brought in and the black box warnings, these came from uh, trials associated with other disease therapies or other disease treatments, whereas now when we're looking at treatments specifically for psoriasis. So we, we want to talk about all of them because I too, like Douglas, use absolutely every one of these therapies, and I'm sure that all four of us on the panel, yeah, we well, use I don't, anything I don't have and anyone, everything. I don't have anyone on Remicade because I don't really have great access to an infusion center, but all the ones that you can either inject in the office or the patient can self-inject, I have many, many patients on them. Or so, Bradalumab yes. because of the REMS program. I don't have anyone on that. And I have patients on, on both of those, and I think that's also what's fun and interesting about our profession is the, the, you want to have a lot of different options, but the crazy thing about this disease is we do not yet have one drug that's gonna be 100% effective for 100% of patients with minimal side effects. So there are some nuances to knowing which therapy to pick, yeah. what things you have to watch out for, which things you should avoid. Certain patients should not use certain Therapies, one of the things, for example, TNF inhibitors, which have been a godsend to so many people for so many diseases, and we're going to be using those for other things like HS with adalimumab, but there are certain patients that you should not use a TNF inhibitor for, and that's part of been the progression of the science. 